So there was an inquiry about the beaver. The beaver is part of what's called the first sense issue. We have a longer presentation that describes all the, the first sense issues. But here we're just looking at the beaver. It's the famous one. We're looking at, there's 12 varieties here that I've chosen. Um, everything from a bisect on 15B. I'd be fascinated to know what Scott Catalog has for 15B as a, as a bisect. Uh, I, I don't have the Scott, I only have the Unitrade. And the pre-cancel, we'll talk a little bit about pre-cancels and why they use them. Thick paper, it's an interesting observation. The majors, of course. The rock and waterfall and split beavers are two popular ones uh, that people can look for. Imprint, preprint increase, position dots, scarifying grid cancel, oxidized, and a Cinderella. This is a fascinating one. I, I, I really don't know what's going on with that one. We'll talk about that one when we get there. Arnie, so this Arnie, is the, you want, Arnie, you want the uh, Scott? Scott yeah, what is what is 15B Scott value listed? Just out of curiosity. Uh, used only $6,500. For 15B, that's a bisect on cover or bisect? Half used, uh, half used as two and a half cent on cover. Okay, on cover. Okay, well, this isn't on cover. This is just on piece. Uh, that's about as close as I'm ever going to get, I figure. Um, <laughs> Pre-cancel. This is a, the pre-cancels are done in these days so that the post office would pre-cancel the stamps, and then if you went in and you're a business and you had to mail a whole bunch of letters to you, you're doing some kind of mailing or or something, you'd buy the sheet and then you'd put the then you'd put these on, and then they wouldn't have to cancel them individually. This is a Montreal 21 roller cancel, and there's a dot here up in the top top left. I don't know I, that will help identify the position. Now, usually, the this means that the dots in the left margin mean it's from the column one on the sheet, but I haven't figured that out. I'm not a plating expert yet. This is the very thick paper. It's an interesting one because it's got these uncleared perf discs. And you can see here, I've highlighted it, whoops, right in the middle, that only one of the perf discs, these are all that has actually been punched through. All of these other perfs, there's an outline of where the punching was done. They're like here, a whole bunch more of um, unpunched perf discs, characteristic of this very thick paper. Bernie, I have a question. How do you sure. know it's thick paper when it's on a cover? Because it's got these characteristic oh, unpunched Okay. Um, and it fits in with the time scale of the purchase order, probably. It's the correct perforations. Um, so you're right. You can't be 100% certain. But when you, when you see that these things haven't been punched through, that's the signal that, that it is, a, it is a, a thick paper. Okay. This is the major reentry. And you can even see it on the stamp. This oh, yeah. left-hand side basically is completely doubled. Mm -hmm. When we look at the close-ups here, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see basically everything has been doubled. The, in the transfer roll, they rocked it and they moved it back and then they rocked it again, but didn't get it in the right position. So it left a complete double impression. Here's That's the top corner too, uh, very dramatic and yeah. Uh, it's about as obvious as you can get with a um, a major re-entry. Here's the rock in the waterfall one from position 53. Um, and this is one that you can see with the naked eye. You can maybe look at it on the stamps. It's that one right there. You see that brown red circle under the beaver there. And in a close-up, that's what we're looking for. It's the rock in the waterfall. It's a plate flaw. It's not a re-entry. So there's a distinction there, um, because but it's it defines the position on the plate. It only occurred once on the plate. And interestingly, this is supposed to be the earliest recorded date for that plate flaw. Um, so it must have happened later on in its life. Only on uh, that re, only on that reentry. Uh, pardon? You show the reentry on the left hand side of the stamp. Yes. If it was a reentry, wouldn't it? also have a double uh, striking or image on the right hand side as well? No, and I can explain that because the, the, the master die that is used 
is transfers its image first, and I'm doing a presentation on this, to what's called a, it's a cylindrical transfer roll. Because you have to apply a lot of pressure. So it's like a rolling pin that you, that you the, the very short rolling pin. The image from the die gets transferred onto the transfer roll, which is this rolling pin. And then you, you use the rolling pin to press it in as you're rolling across the face of the, die, of the plate. And that allows you to get a lot of pressure in a very localized area when it's on a rolling pin configuration, as opposed to just a, a full plate pushing down flat. So what's happened here is they've rolled it. It looks like they rolled it from the, the right to the left. And then they went back to the right and got the right side of the stamp perfectly and moved it forward again on the left. And there was a slight misalignment in the, in the transfer roll as it's being rolled across. Like, as I said, I hope you understand. So like a rolling pin. It will be the subject of a, a next presentation to explain all the terminology here and explain how these re-entries are produced. I have, but I still have your other question from two or three weeks ago, and I'll answer that in a couple minutes. This is the rock and the waterfall, we talked about it. And here's another split lever. This one you cannot see just simply by looking at the cover. Uh, it's a very faint line that runs diagonally through the beaver's nose but it's also defined a particular position as a plate flaw, uh, position number 90 on, on the plate. Um, the imprint, of course, the imprints appear on around the margin of the, of the uh, printing plate. And this particular one is in the bottom. They're upside down on the bottom. So there's two, there's one between position 93 and 94 here, or 92 and 93. And then there's another one in the lower right hand, closer, closer to 97 and 98, no, 98 and 99. And it is interesting that they're upside down in the bottom corners of the plate. Um, not much more to say about that one. Oh, the interesting thing, this is a Great West Railway, um, uh, transportation, well, what do you call it? moving, moving uh, postmark from there. This is their east, east the way that this train is going on its eastbound journey and uh, on the Great West Railway. Nice one. Yeah. Um, and this is a pre printing crease. Um, there are a lot of pre printing creases offered on eBay if you search for them, but the majority of them are not. Uh, they're post-printing creases. The pre-printing creases will all have this characteristic white line. You can't get a pre-printing crease on cover because usually the crease only shows up when it's soaked and comes off a cover. And here you can see this. It's interesting. What I caught my eye here was how there was still even black ink in the pre-printing crease. So that meant this part of the ink was so deep that it got right into the paper quite deep. But uh, um, so this is now this is it's also got some position dots. So I sent this off to Jim Watt, a personal friend and avid collector of the stamp. He quickly told me it's he knows where he knew the position of it and the state. It was very early on in its life um, for this position. But it's these dots in the corner that are critical to giving away where it is on the printing plate. Here's another one of the re-entry and some dots. Um, fairly straightforward. Um, again, but this is interesting because in addition to the dots, it's also got a very faint guideline. So that's another thing that can help identify where it was uh, on the plate. All we know is that it was in column one, but I can't tell you, well, I know it wasn't positioned from one because it's different dots, but uh, some of the dots are, are available. So it's a cue to, to knowing where it is. Are these dots, put on the plate deliberately or are there, there are errors of some there? No, I believe they're put on the plate deliberately. And who would, who would be using them? Why would they, why were they there? I don't know. Just for philatelists, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I think it helps them maybe to, they would put the dot on, but first, like they, if, if I were guessing, I'd say that they put this dot here on and that helped the guy when he's putting the transfer dot roll on to know where to start the impression. 
The scarifying grid cancel. We've made, I've talked about that one in the past, but this is protected a little more and more interesting because this, when I sent this off to, to Jim Watt, he said, you know, this is what his reply was, that he said, Hermann Goring of Nazi Germany wrote to relatives in Toronto. A parent or even trans, trans grandparent may have come from Hamilton. It's not too far from Toronto. He went back to Germany. I don't know much else about it, but there is a Canadian connection to Herr Goering. And it wouldn't be too much of a stretch because in this case, Mr. Goering here is a wine merchant. And we know the Germans are, are excellent in, in their wine connoisseurs and vineyards. So, but more important about the scarifying grid cancel, these are where the this cancel has actually got little steel pegs in it and the ink is then transferred onto the paper and into these marks that are created. There's learned more about these. There's actually three different designs. They're only used for about less than a year, all in Toronto. And I'm still on the looking out for other scarifying grid cancels, Toronto cancels from, from, 19, from 1867 is what I'm looking for on cover. Arnie? Uh, yes. Uh what what is meant by that term scarifying scar to to scarify to 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 deface to create a permanent scar so that refers to these little punch marks is yes i see okay the cancel is actually quite it's a regular cancel that how you can see the different bars going across but then they have interrupted three of these bars one of these bars on this one and put these pins in so that and then when you inked it these pins get ink on them. And then when you put it to the stamp, the, these pins create impressions and transfer the ink into the, well, the scar. The scarifying is just a, a way to, to, is a term to, to say, to deface with a, to deface is a, is, 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 is a, is a term. Like you can also, you call it a defacing mm -hmm. grid cancel. Scarifying is what they call them. Arnie, what was, the actual, what was the um, the date range for the use of those roughly? Uh, January to September, eighteen sixty seven. So, just going back to the scarifying for a second. So, they'd put these little holes in, and then they'd ink it, and the ink would sink into the holes. At what point did they put the holes in? Once the like before the stamp was on cover, or no, the the hammer itself. The hammer has makes got holes. Pins. The, the, the canceling hammer has got pins that stick out. And then when you ink them, the, the pins get the ink too on the outside. And then you hammer the envelope and the pins go into the paper, creating that little recess that you can see here, the two of them. And the ink that's on that pin then goes into the paper. And the idea is to prevent you from washing the ink off mm -hmm. and reusing the stamp. Um, got it. It, was only, it wasn't as successful. Other countries tried it too. It wasn't just Canada. Um, and Toronto was the main, there's some indicator that St. John, New Brunswick may have also done it. I haven't seen any cancels with that, um, but it was up to the individual postmasters. And so this is the Toronto postmaster. They did it with three different designs, but of course the pins took a lot of wear. It was discontinued when they abandoned the idea of, of these cancels. You know, that, that sounds actually related to the use of grills in U.S. stamps, where they, they before using the stamp, they punched it with a pattern of, of grills, which, which um, cut into the fibers and allowed the ink of the cancellation to soak in more. It's a very similar process, only, you know, it it's a question of whether you do the, the breaking of the fibers uh, before or during the cancellation. The end objective is the same. Um, the oxidized. This is an oxidized one. I questioned why, why this color was so unusual. Look at this one. But it's oxidized. And when I talked to Jim about it, he said, well, all you have to, he, he can say, you know, with peroxide, la, 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 I can do it. He can clean it and get it back to its original cover. Well, I didn't want to risk that. He said, you got to be careful. Don't get any of it on the cover because it'll stain the cover. And I like the cover the way it is. And it becomes a variety that way. This is an interesting one only because of the contents in it. Um, I think that's fun, fascinating to read these, these old letters uh, to the bailiff in Jordan from, well, this is the stamp, nothing particularly special about the stamp. Oh, yes, there is. Okay, no, this, there is more about this stamp. And if you notice it, you can see some extra lines up here 
And there's some extra lines down here. We'll look at some close-ups of it. Up in the top right, we're going to see this, this doubling here of the frame line. And we see some extra marks here and some extra marks here. And down here, we see some extra marks and extra marks, all horizontal. Everything seems to have these marks are all shifted vertically. And they are now, they are all part of one re-entry. And the question is, well, how can this, how can the re-entry just be here and not continue around? Or why isn't it further? And this is part of a re-entry. It's a different type of re-entry than the first one we looked at. And the first one we actually looked where it was a transfer rule and it came across and did a broad thing. In this case, what happened was they did their, they used the transfer rule, created an impression on the die. And for whatever reason, maybe it was centered too high on the plate, my option. And they wanted us, they can't throw the plate away. They have to burnish it out. So they burn, the term burnish is to remove the, the markings from the previous transfer roll and start all over again. And in this case, when they burnished the die, burnished the plate, they didn't remove every, all the marks. So that's why you see marks in isolated. They weren't as careful in, in burnishing the dye to remove all the, 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 the residuals, if you want to call it, from the previous uh, application of the transfer rule. So that's how come you can get sometimes just very isolated marks. But they are, although they are different features, they are collectively referred to as a single re-entry. It's not different re-entries. It's not, there's, there's not a re-entry here and a re-entry there. They are all on one stamp. It's all one, it's only the singular term that's used. When you showed that very dramatic example of the, of the re-entry, it looks like they didn't make any effort to remove those lines. No, for whatever reason, that one got through the cracks. And uh, so this is the letter. It's from the lawyer saying, I herewith enclose you a landlord's warrant to collect $60 cent due rent due me from John Crow yesterday. <laughs> the warrant shows you where he lives. And I believe Mr. Crow is now being sued and is a, in good deal insolvent. I hope you will go immediately and make a distress. I think, I think it's fascinating reading old English. Make a distress so that I may secure my rent. I would not have sent you down this warrant so soon were it not that I am obliged to do so to protect myself against the other creditors. You will therefore please act at once. You are allowed by law, as you are no doubt aware, to collect your fees out of Mr. Crow. So in addition to having to pay the rent, looks like he has to pay some bail of fees to collect the rent. So this is addressed to bail of Joy, Jordan from a lawyer, a barrister ball. And the last one, I think, oh, no, this is another re-entry. Um, position 44 on an embossed cover. This is just a small one. Here you can see just down in the corner, but that's enough to tell us where the position is. It's also looks like an oxidized stamp. Finally, the Cinderella. This is one I have no clue what it is. Someone went ahead and created some kind of printing method an engraving and printed it on this paper, created some kind of artificial hand-drawn forged grid cancel. A little bit of scuffing here has removed it, obviously. The paper they used looked like it was the back of some scrap piece of paper that says, just arrived arithmetic textbooks or something like this. No idea, it was a piece of scrap paper that somebody went ahead and printed this on What's fascinating is I compared it with a, a, a true stamp and I was looking at the position of the sun. <laughs> that is the position of the sun in the bottom. It just catches the edge of the O here and down here vertically. And when you go horizontally, bang on. It's right between the A and the G up here, just catching the top of the G. The sun is in a perfect position just to the off the tail of the R. They don't have the ghosting on the R. It's, it's incredibly canny, uncanny how, why is that sun so carefully positioned? The lettering and everything, is this a pre-engraving? Is this the artist's concept of what he's trying to make the stamp gonna look like? 
This could have been created by a method involving tracing, like put, put somebody putting a piece of tracing paper over and very carefully just tracing the stamp, including even the perforations, which uh, look like real, somewhat damaged perforations. Yeah, I hadn't thought of the tracing idea, but somebody created a die. This is printed. This is not just someone creating a, a, a doing a printing by hand drawn, uh, you know, I'm taking my red pencil or red ink pen and drawing these lines. They printed it. Yeah. Lastly. So that's the last one. And I think I'm going to have to leave because. Uh, we're